Without further ado, the man, myth, the legend, Dr. Dodger Hall. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Susie. Um, welcome. Uh, it does take a village to make a lecture sometimes, and, and these uh, lecture series seem to be part of that. And so I'm, I'm glad you all could be part of the village for tonight. If you're a student of mine, um, I have a, you don't need to do it now, I have a sign up sheet for you. If you could just sign your name and what class you're in before you, before you leave, that would be great. If you're not a student, you can just leave uh, when we're when we're all done. Um, I do want to welcome you. I know some of you were here last week, and some of you were or were not. And so I have a, just a little bit of, of overlap uh, between the uh, two. Tonight we're going to be getting much more into into Alan Hancock's uh, own life. I mean, we it was kind of leading up to him last time. Uh, we're looking at his his family and some other things. I just got into animation just recently, and so I'm just, oh, I can try out certain things. And I don't understand the lines, but what I want now is to add sound effects. Boom, 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 boom. I'll get that eventually, so. Um, but I do want to talk about him in these uh, years, uh, uh, mostly in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, and uh, the third and final lecture on him is going to be uh, primarily about things associated with uh, his time in Santa Maria. And this is a little more associated with things in Los Angeles, but he has gone so much, it also takes us to a number of other, uh, other places. As I said last week, uh, he has a, a fairly interesting family, to say the least, and uh, we spent some time looking at Augustine Heresty and uh, on many of his adventures and travels and all the things that he accomplished which were incredible. One of them of course being the, the, the starting of the premium wine industry in, in California. Uh, his mother and, uh, and all of the, the setbacks she dealt with and then how she though is the one that, that really brought the family the wealth that it has primarily from the oil industry. And his father one of the early surveyors of uh, Los Angeles who was able to buy a, a, a what turned out to be a very prime area of central Los Angeles <laughs> way back when it was just a couple thousand people living there. And as, uh, as both he, Hancock's mother and father, if you were here, you recall, they came out during the gold rush. She was six years old and he was 21 years older. And, uh, and of course they eventually would meet and marry. He may have made his money in the gold rush. I just like using that again. Uh, he may not. We're not quite sure. They do have uh, two children who survive. Uh, Alan Hancock had a, a, a twin who died in infancy. Uh, but there's he and his brother, uh, Alan on the right with the dark hair, about five years old. And, um, and Bertram, uh, who's two years, uh, two years younger. And as I was saying, they, you know, they were in this area of, of what became central Los Angeles and is sitting literally on top of a lot of oil. And, and it was seen as a nuisance to some or like his father was mined for kind of the tar, the asphalt form of it. But the mother is the one who through leasing and then the creation, the family business was the Rancho La Brea uh, oil company. And uh, that's where Hancock had learned the oil business and how they were making by the early 1900s uh, tremendous income. As, as I said, that would be, if, if it was $1,000 a day to some Americans at that time, that would be more than a year's income. Uh, might be a couple years. And so the, the Hancocks, and of course that's part of Rancho La Brea as, as Los Angeles grew, were going to, this was really going to be the springboard of of wealth that he uh, that he's going to have, and as I pointed out, his mother and he, but primarily his mother, built what was considered one of the more prestigious, glamorous, interesting, large, four-story, 23-room mansion, which unfortunately she was only able to live in for four years before she uh, before she died, and unfortunately the house was torn down in 1939. But uh, just to give you a sense again of where Hancock is coming from after years of 
of some difficulty and then, and then into this uh, period of, of great wealth. Uh, he had married in 1901. Genevieve Mullen, uh, the, the name Mullen, I'll show you again, was a, was a pretty significant name in Los Angeles in the retail industry. And uh, they, of course, have two children, Bertram, he had his brother Bertram who died when he was 16 and now he has a son Bertram. And then Rosemary uh, two, years, uh, two years later. And then of course Genevieve there in the, in the middle. And as I was kind of finishing up last time, you know, it was around early 1900s. And I just wanted to step back a little bit because this is a, a Hancock and all I ever find in the picture is with an unidentified friend. I think he was identified somewhere, but, uh, but there he is with what was called the second car in Los Angeles, literally a horseless carriage. Um, he seemed to be interested in moving around and transportation, and this would be kind of like a novelty. As you see, it was an expensive novelty. That would be, for today's cost, about a little over $22,000. The Milwaukee Steamer Company didn't last that long. Um, Big five horsepower engine though, must have been pretty good. Uh, and there he is right around 1900 in that Stanhope model. Um, there he is, the young businessman. This is actually one of my favorite pictures. I don't know, it's just something really nice about it. This is uh, the part of the Rancho La Brea offices in, uh, in Los Angeles. So Hancock is uh, 33 years old. Um, you can see his mother's portrait up on the uh, wall. Um, if you see on his desk, there's actually a little, um, mo it's a photograph of the villa that they were constructing or right around finishing. I'm not quite sure if this picture was 1908 or 1909, 19 something like that, and the house was finished around 1909. Um, he had two telephones, which would be a you know, not most, most people didn't have telephones and many businesses certainly didn't have any. So he was on kind of the modern side of things. Yeah. That's the building where the office is. And they had this, the, uh, the top five floors on this, uh, this building that was uh, constructed just a few years before and again, Los Angeles. And so he's running the oil industry uh, business from, uh, from there. His interest in automobiles got him, and he seemed to so often be kind of one of those early participants in things. He is one of 10 people in Southern California, 10 men who founded uh, the, uh, the Southern California branch of the Automobile Club uh, as the, in 1900. And as you see then, he became a board member for several years and board president at a time when there really wasn't much in terms of automobiles. So they were just going out there doing it themselves, <laughs> putting up some signs. And they actually published a, um, a road map, which was considered one of the first four cars, publishing uh, maps that you had in, uh, in Los Angeles. And, uh, and again, he, he just seemed to get a little more into whatever his interests were than to just, uh, uh, say, buy the car. Uh, got a little more uh, there. The Good Roads program was part of it. So here's Los Angeles, late 1800s. You know, I don't want to keep Hancock in just a vacuum, like how did all this happen? What, what's, gonna, what's gonna go on in the next few years? Uh, the city is, is really undergoing explosive growth. Uh, there's just a combination of, of the rail lines and, and the rail industry encouraging tourism. Uh, the city uh, has long really been built on speculation and bringing in more people and selling these vast areas of these, these large valleys. Um, in a practical sense, Los Angeles has no business being where it is. Uh, it doesn't have anywhere near enough uh, water. Uh, it's, it's going to be so far flung. Los Angeles County today is, I believe, the largest county in the United States. It's one of them. <coughs> not one of them, not the largest. San Bernardino is the largest. I knew that. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and so these far-flung cities, these little communities are, are gonna you know, need to be joined together if they're going to be a greater Los Angeles. And, and the, 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 you know, 
just a, a, you know, it's a, it's a lot of numbers, but just to show you how, how when it finally starts to take off, how fast and rapid the, the increase is. I mean, it, it tilted the graph. You know, the weight is so heavy. See how it goes to the right there by 1940? Um, these are percentages by years, 1890 to 1880, to 90. I mean, you had 450% increase in the population in a decade. The next decade, it doubles. The next decade, it triples on top of exponential growth. And it really doesn't slow down. The percentages eventually drop just because the numbers are so huge. But as you see, here's Hancock, born in 1875, when there's around 10,000 people in Los Angeles. And there he is in 1910, 319,000. Uh, and it just keeps going. So tremendous opportunities for the, the wily businessman, and Hancock's going to be one of those. And of course, and it's, it's actually just a shade over 4 million today, I guess unofficially. Uh, and that's just the city of, of Los Angeles. So, so that's, of course, part of its you know, success, but success causes problems like way back in 1900, uh, it, was, it was running out of water. Uh, the, it's just not sustainable with the Los Angeles River being the main river there, it was kind of getting tapped out. And they were using so much water every day, a lot of it for plants and lawns because it's fairly dry area as you, as you know. And so something had to, had to fix this if they were going to continue this growth and have people like Hancock remain and be, uh, and be successful with this kind of change in, in this rapid, rapid period of time. So this is, not, this is just a couple of minutes, not exactly about, about Hancock, but about the things happening during his time. Here's an idea that never happened. You know, there are places in the world they've built artificial islands or reefs. Uh, and this was somebody's idea, clearly, to have more marinas, more housing, more beachfront, just make a bunch of artificial beaches. And for whatever reason, that, that never happened. It may seem too audacious, the idea of creating beaches, creating a second front to it. Uh, you know, it's too much for some people. On the other hand, if you know anything about Los Angeles, you know one of the ways they solved their, their water problem was they essentially looked far and wide as where could we find an adequate supply of fresh water. And in the Owens Valley, more than 200 miles away, they found a river. And what did they do with that river? More than 200 miles from Los Angeles. They brought it to Los Angeles. I mean, and that is, that is a crazy project. As it says there, this titanic project to give the city a river. The Los Angeles River wasn't enough. Let's, let's build a, an aqueduct, uh, even if we have to go through a desert. And, and this says something to the spark and spirit and determination of, of a number of individuals to, to do this. Uh, it's, the, the, as it turns out, the, the longest aqueduct in the world at the time. And you go through desert like the Mojave, you also have to go over some significant uh, hills, if you want to call them that. And you've got to work in those conditions. They had several thousand people in the, in the field uh, they had all kinds of heat issues. This amazing part of this uh, system uses no energy to get this water up and over these hills. It's all based on just, you know, suction. And, and it actually creates energy because on the other side, going downhill, they would build power plants and have the water rush through it and, uh, and uh, create electricity that way. So when it, this opens in 1913, it really is a miracle, the turning the last gate, and about 40,000 people came out. Um, I believe, just from his hat, I'm not, uh, it looks like William Mulholland, who was the, really the architect of this whole enterprise. He was the head of the Los Angeles Water uh, Bureau, and he and uh, some others were the ones that conceived of this plan. They gave little souvenir bottles of water that, that opening day, on, uh, they just had some there. I've never seen one of those things, but uh, kind of cool. And Mulholland turned to city officials as the water comes cascading down and says, there it is, gentlemen, take it. And so they did. 
and, uh, and, and it saves Los Angeles in a sense for, for some time. It creates a whole big havoc and problem in New Orleans Valley. The river was taken. And, uh, and for decades, there will be court suits and lawsuits because it left all kinds of uh, pollution problems, uh, dried up a lake, there was environmental concerns. In the early 2000s, they came to some solutions with the Owens Valley. But in the early 19-teens, that wasn't the issue. And this 233-mile aqueduct was, was uh, as I said, importing far more water than they needed for about 20, 30 years, and then they run out again, and they run out. It's like today. Where will Los Angeles get its water in the future? Ah, then they, they've had that issue for a very long time. But, but this allowed this early success uh, to continue. The other thing I'd point out uh, is somebody like Henry Huntington, who came to Los Angeles by way of his uncle, who helped build the Transcontinental Railroad. And one of the major contributions of Huntington was he's the one that helped first you really kind of link together all those communities. What were 60 and now are 88 different communities by a fairly high speed, low cost electric transportation system, this electric railway that went to these far flung valleys and encouraged people that, yeah, you could live out here because we have basically a high speed transportation system for you. And Huntington provided the trains, which are sometimes called the red line, because all the cars were red. And he built different reservoirs and municipal power systems for, you know, to, to feed all the power for this. But he made so much money in real estate and, and other business ventures, he, he far exceeded the wealth of of his, uh, his uncle Collis and his Transcontinental Railroad. And up until the 1950s, this was, this was also part of Los Angeles. What happened to the Huntington Red Lines? Anybody know? They ripped up the tracks. You know why? Modernity. City officials saw in the 19, late 40s and 50s the future of Los Angeles for public transportation was buses. And, uh, and, and cars, of course, were, were dominant. So they took it all out. And now, of course, they're in a way trying to put some of it back in. Um, but uh, they had a pretty good system there for a while. But these things and these kind of people and this sort of daring do or is the kind of thing that would help somebody like, like Alan Hancock. Um, so there's Los Angeles in 1915, this bustling city of several hundred thousand people and, of course, just growing every day. Uh, as, uh, as we know, and, and the trolley system, and of course cars coming in. And as I was pointing out last time, here's the 40-year-old Hancock. Both his parents have, uh, have died. His, he never knew his grandfather. He's married and has these two young children. He's a multimillionaire. He could do everything. He, he could do nothing. He could do whatever he wanted. Uh, and, um, you know, and so what's he going to do? One of the first things that they were looking at was, well, of course, we have this land, the, the La Brea, the Rancho La Brea, that has not just the, the oil, but it has, has the, the tar fields and the pits. And you couldn't really dig in large areas of it without coming across fossils. And Hancock was interested in these things, and so was his mother. And, uh, and as you see, I mean, there are areas where there are just so many of them Way back, they acquired the Rancho in 1860. Uh, they showed uh, this canine uh, tooth to this, uh, this uh, geologist who um, was looking to see for oil. And he started to write about it. And some other people started to write about these things. And Hancock, both he and his mother, didn't want this to just all somehow get paved over. Uh, they, they wanted it to be, uh, to be preserved. And so uh, there's Alan, it's hard to really see him, and his brother, uh, Bertram, back when, so Alan's about 15, out on this, this punt on one of those lakes that would have probably some bubbles and, you know, might have a little oily smell to it uh, out there. And so they were, they were determined to try and set aside some of that uh, land 
unattractive as it may look um, because of its, uh, its uh, geologic and uh, fossil records. Uh, and so thank goodness that they did. You know, all kinds of things. I guess this is one of the most common animals there. You get people going, animals, people. You get animals going there to, to drink water, and of course you have predators coming. And these were all things that used to be in California. Um, and, uh, and they, of course, found large numbers, sometimes even intact skeletons of, of some, of these, uh, some of these things. Uh, as you see, back in 1900, these are doing oil production and just, they, just fossils and fossils. So they set aside this uh, 10 acres it was actually started for a couple of years and giving Los Angeles the right to do some excavations. Um, later, he, uh, Hancock is going to expand that land and make it permanent as a, uh, as, as a donation uh, to, the, uh, to the city. So, I don't know what it said on the job application. Must like solving puzzles. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> and <laughs> If you enjoy that kind of game, uh, you can you can have uh, have quite a lot of work, and they're still doing that today, uh, still digging in places. Eventually, as I said, he expands the size, and uh, this is part of the blueprints for what becomes the area of La Brea. And now there's the museum, and still, of course, tar pits, and still, of course, uh, some uh, the work uh, work going on uh, here. Only one. One human body or remains have been found. Uh, this La Brea woman, just one of these oddities, nine or 10,000 years old. Don't know how she ended up there. I'm not quite sure. Um, but everything else is, is, as I said, they're doing them here. So. Um, and you know, here's, here's what he and his mother helped, helped create. Uh, a, a museum that attracts a third of a million people a year uh, in the middle of Los Angeles. Uh, a, a kind of unique museum uh, with one of the better collections of fossils and uh, you know the kind of things that you, that you bring down. Uh, as, as we were saying last week, the Brea means tar, so it's the tar tar pits uh, and, and museum. And I came across some site, I guess they're, uh, on their site they're defensive about it, and I guess Sahara Desert, Sahara means desert, and they're saying, well, it's desert, desert. <laughs> Leave us alone. Um, <laughs> So Hancock's wish would be ultimately fulfilled, that this land would be, would be set aside. And there's a marker on the grounds to him, uh, the, the Page Museum, and uh, you know, for his, his contributions to uh, uh, this form of, of history. This is another thing that Hancock, he did not get the idea of developing Wilshire Boulevard, but he would, he would get into it. This, uh, this uh, realtor, A.W. Ross, saw this rural area of Los Angeles, and then you see that intersection there of Wilshire and Fairfax, and had this idea of developing Wilshire, and some people thought, it's too far out of the city, it's too removed, it's not successful, generally people are you know, in city centers, but his concept, which becomes probably one of the big influences from this, is that, well, it's not designed for walkers, it's designed for cars. And, and Wilshire Boulevard will be a boulevard of development, mostly used by, uh, by cars. And um, so it was in 1928 that people started calling it the Miracle Mile, that it's actually working. <laughs> it's actually attracting the businesses. And Wilshire and Fairfax, that little dirt road a uh, few years before, is building up. It just keeps building. There it is, as uh, just before World War II for the United States. <coughs> and Hancock had good reason to invest in it. It was a good financial investment, as it uh, as it turns out. But where's his rancho? Where's his rancho? Right along Wilshire Boulevard. And you see there near the top. That kind of squared off open area, that's the, the tar pits. And then, well, really kind of a block over all the, the oil fields that, uh, that was all part of Rancho La Brea. They, they were selling off some tracts of it through the years as development kind of just encircled them. 
I counted over 40 different derricks there, and there may be more uh, today. They still had a lot of oil production going on. But Wilshire Boulevard right along with the tar pits, and then so Hancock, it, it, it just seemed to dovetail in together, seemed to work for him to, uh, to have that. What was his wife's name? Genevieve Vollen, and uh, Mullen Blewett was a significant clothing store. Uh, went out of business, it looks like, in the 1940s. This would be, I'd say, akin to kind of like a Nordstrom's, kind of an upscale development for clothes. And uh, uh, Andrew Mullen, Genevieve's father, was one of the um, uh, one of the two people. So again, there was a kind of a good meeting there. Um, uh, between the uh, between the families and and the business arrangements that they uh, that they had, so Hancock certainly profited from his his work on on Wilshire and uh, and the Miracle Mile. Uh, there are a lot of museums there today. Sometimes it's also called Museum Row, uh, Los Angeles County Museum. There's a, a Native American Museum. I think there's a Western Museum. There's there's a number of things on on a section very close to the tar pits as uh, as uh, as it is today they gave him this proclamation i can read almost none of it because i can't find a clear picture i don't know i tried everywhere i can see it says miracle mile proclamation alan hancock that's about all i can read i, I can't see anything more of it so i gotta just keep looking so do, doing this turnaround i must say from last week to this week it's like a lot of this is kind of still fresh out of the oven um, so it was just it was a it was a quick a quick turnaround, and I'm hoping to find more of some of these things. If you heard of Hancock Park, absolutely, it's it's Alan Hancock. Uh, that's another area of the Rancho that he developed as um, uh, subdivided and developed starting in actually 1921 as a I don't know high end as a as a nice set of neighborhoods uh, here. And you again see Wilshire and uh, La Brea and just another area of it. There was an actual park within Hancock Park, but it's the greater housing development that he's going to uh, uh, look at. He was kind of particular about it. Has a setback significantly from the street uh, for appearance. They buried most of the power lines. Um, he chose concrete as opposed to asphalt because he just liked the lighter color on the street and you know just had some particulars as to how they how they wanted to uh, have it uh, have it look um, then now there's a homeowner association it's it's got a level of historic status you can't do certain things to the uh, uh, many of the houses most of them still have these these original facades and as you see, roughly about a little over 10,000 people in 1,200 houses there. But this was, you know, again, and you see by its location, <coughs> kind of in that west central Los Angeles and uh, prime real estate, Beverly Boulevard and Fairfax and Hollywood and all that, you know, it's right there. So, so it was just so fortunate for him where his father got the rancho and what then uh, his mother and son were able to, wife and son, were able to do with it. So, I, I found people who would just drive through the neighborhood and, and have their cameras and, and just, and I thought of showing you some of them, but yeah, it's okay. Although sometimes they got into conversations that are kind of interesting while they're not really thinking they're recording things. So, I don't know if you have, these are the kind of houses running your taste. I like a lot of these older homes. Um, thinking about, you know, we can maybe make an offer on something, I don't know. <laughs> and then I kept looking in and, hmm, you know, it's really hard to keep checkerboard floors clean. I might pass on these after all, I don't know. They <laughs> maybe look around a different neighborhood. That's, yee, <laughs> it's a little more upscale, but uh, anyways, they're, they're nice homes, I assume, uh, that, you, that you find. Hancock is, is uh, just a little more of his real estate. Uh, he is, he's going to provide the capital to build this bank, which, which is going to be a part of this, what was called Hibernian Bank. Um, 
there's a Hibernia bank that started in New Orleans, and I haven't yet figured out if this is a branch of that, uh, or if this is a separate entity, but eventually this becomes the Bank of California, which was a much bigger bank <coughs> later. Um, but Hancock was just, in, he, he never worked a day as a banker, but they made him a vice president um, because he, he gave him the money for this building, and uh, assumably that was, that was enough for them. Um, so he was doing a number of real estate things like, uh, like that. As I said last time, I mean, his, his family has um, a series of, of tragedies. I mean, his 16-year-old brother uh, died of typhoid. His father, were, he was only eight when his father died. His grandfather uh, died at 69, perhaps killed by crocodiles. Um, Bertram is going to, his son is going to uh, die uh, young. This is, uh, 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 the little stars are the, the last day of Bertram's life in uh, 1925. Um, Bertram, you know, it's just one son, one daughter. Bertram was interested in the theater for a number of years as a, as a young man. And I don't know, and I don't know if I will know, all of the personal details but at the age of 22, he was in some fashion convinced to not prepare to take over his father's business, but to get into the family business that his father had. Um, and, and kind of put the, if there was an acting interest, more on, on, on the back uh, side. And so he was going to meet his father in Santa Barbara uh, in June of 1925 for this purpose, that they were then going to start this however long process of his learning something about what is, you know, maybe in some capacity taking part of this, uh, this, this business over uh, at, some, uh, at some point. But it was that night, that the next morning, that the Santa Barbara earthquake um, uh, hit and Bertram would be a casualty. Uh, in that, uh, in that the, the last really devastating earthquake in Santa Barbara. Um, kind of like the 1906 earthquake in San Francisco, which was about a little after five in the morning, so still very early, very little movement on the streets, most people sleeping or you know, in their homes uh, and all. And, but a significant earthquake, did a, did a that's 1925 dollars, for, uh, for damages. And the, the, the downtown was, uh, I wouldn't say leveled, but significantly harmed. And actually, a lot of the way Santa Barbara looks today, it came out of this earthquake. There was more of a unity of appearance in the new buildings than what you had prior to this. Um, but as you see, I mean, the, the brick buildings, as they frequently do, are, um, uh, if they don't completely collapse, significantly damaged, that's the, the mission, uh, which had a significant amount of, of damage as, uh, as well. Uh, part of the tower collapsed uh, there. Bertram and his father arrived independently at the Arlington Hotel, which was seen as the hotel of Santa Barbara. Uh, I mean, pretty significant uh, in, uh, in the downtown area. It's just one of their postcards of their lobby. <coughs> the original Arlington had been destroyed in a fire completely. It was rebuilt then, and to hold off fires in this tower, they installed this 50,000 gallon um, uh, water tank to protect it from, from fires. And unfortunately, that's going to be really probably what kills, uh, kills Bertram. Uh, a gallon of water weighs eight pounds, so that's about 400,000 pounds of water uh, that they, if it's completely filled. Alan Hancock, because of who he was, was given this suite on this, this area of the, of the tower. And as you see, he's with one of his business associates. When his son arrived, for some reason, they switched rooms. And Hancock gave Bertram the suite and Hancock, as you see, and, and Chapman were in rooms off on the other side of the, uh, the building. Early morning, the, the quake 
begins. You can see the Arlington there. And if you see right in the center, right where that tower is, that water tank came loose and just crashed straight through the entire tower. And uh, two of the 13 people who were killed in the earthquake, two of them died in the Arlington, Bertram being one, and an 83-year-old woman uh, who was across the hall being another. And it's believed they were killed instantly. I mean, it just, as you see, just totally demolished that, uh, that tower. Um, uh, Hancock, Alan Hancock, was significantly injured. Um, some people apparently thought he might have died just by how he looked. He was, had something punctured uh, around his lung. Uh, he had broken bones. He would spend a couple of weeks in a, um, a hospital. He gave an interview about a week after the earthquake uh, to a, the Santa Barbara News Press, and uh, that's one of his, one of the quotes that he had in there. He said he just, he saw the, 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 the tower go down and he just, he just assumed Bertram had, had died. I uh, couldn't imagine how he would survive. So it apparently affected Hancock's speech and something of his mobility for the rest of his life to some degree. I don't know how much, uh, but he was significantly injured as well. So as I said, you know, he, he has gone through a series of losses and then Bertram is, is yet another one in uh, just age of 22. The Arlington Theater is on the site of the Arlington Hotel. They didn't rebuild the hotel. So if you ever see or been to the Arlington, which is, of course, built in the Great Depression, uh, that's where that, that hotel once was, at least a portion of it was where the Arlington is. And of course, the Arlington has that mission design as, as many of the buildings now in Santa Barbara do. So Genevieve, his first wife, uh, it's a long marriage, but she um, became ill and had, I, I believe it was cancer, and the last two years of her life was, uh, was a struggle. She's only 57, and, uh, and she dies in 1936. And um, Hancock is uh, going to remarry Helen Leaf Morgan uh, in 1939. Uh, her husband was a business associate, uh, not her husband, that would be wrong. Um, <laughs> it wasn't her husband, it was some other family member. And, um, um, no, that's right, uh, edit, edit. And um, <laughs> this was not going to be a happy or successful marriage. Um, uh, Helen Leaf Morgan, I, I really don't know enough about her but you hear very strong opinions about her. If you look in Hancock's Red Book, the, the, probably the most comprehensive thing that was really put out about his life near the end of his life, she's not even mentioned. She doesn't exist. And in fact, many times people didn't know that he was gonna be married ultimately three times because he kind of just blots this out. It wasn't, for whatever reason, it, it was unsuccessful. Um, he flew her down to Panama. It started off so romantically in 1939. Flew her down to Panama, and they were married on one of his, his ships. Um, but here it is in 1945. She's suing him for divorce on the grounds of mental cruelty. If you read through some other articles, it seems that he was never home. He, he, you know, he wasn't around. He didn't do things. In this story, it says that, um, oh, was, I, was it this one that he, he just kind of spent time to himself? Maybe that was a different story. But she wanted to live in the standard that she had become accustomed. And so um, this is in the early uh, part of 1945, and they settled relatively quickly, considerable amount of money for the, the marriage and the time. And in total, she got a, a $200,000 house, $300,000, $309,000 in cash, two automobiles, a trust fund, and uh, when she later in her life died, when Alan Hancock was told the news, 
uh, his, his response was, I put that woman out of my life a long time ago. He just, I, I don't know all of what happened, but it, um, she says that she kind of seemed to be carrying out the divorce in the newspaper there. He refused to reconcile. Uh, oh, this is the one where he, he, he kept himself when he was home in the basement where he practiced, and that would be, I think, his musical instrument. Um, but a short, unhappy, unhappy marriage for him. What's he doing all those years? He is gone a lot. <laughs> he did travel considerably. Um, I don't know about the mental cruelty part, but I don't know if that was part of it. Uh, but uh, anyways, he was a person that just liked to go places. And the car was just the beginning of, of things. So here he is in the 1920s. Uh, he's looking at these burial grounds. What do you think of how he's dressed out there in the field? <laughs> Suit and tie. I don't even wear a tie. And I'm here. Um, I don't think he, he I, you rarely do see him. And there are some scenes where he's, he's more casual. But, uh, but yeah, that's the 1920s or Alan Hancock. It's a combination of things. Looking at uh, what you would probably not be doing today with burial grounds. Uh, just sort of, hmm. Um, but that was what he did. But Hancock was, a, was an explorer. He was interested in science. Uh, the, the Brea was really just the start of it. Uh, he was a licensed ship's captain and apparently had uh, eventually the, uh, the license to command any size uh, vessel on the, on the seas. And uh, looking rather dapper there on uh, one of his, uh, his vessels. Starts off with this one, the cricket. Uh, nice. This was just, this wasn't for exploration. This is, this is just, you know, sailing and, and uh, traveling around. And he's going to trade up for Valero. Uh, another one that was, you know, considerably larger, but, uh, but wasn't going to be uh, enough for what he uh, is going to be ultimately interested in. These are more in the 1920s. And he's, he's going to have some of these. He's going to Move up to the Valero II, so Valero meant smooth sailing, and a larger <coughs> vessel. And they're not just ships, they are outfitted with equipment, with scientific maritime research equipment. And Hancock will ultimately work his way up to larger ships. Uh, the Oaxaca uh, was one that he, he bought and then had re-outfitted for, for his interest for several years. He would take his first major exploration on, uh, on this vessel, uh, and, um, but kind of kept moving up through the, uh, through the years. And, and this, I think, was kind of the, the, the preeminent one. It's not his last, but, but the Valero III, nearly 200 feet long, and was considered one of the finest research vessels, privately owned research vessels in the country. Uh, and, and Hancock just seemed to spare no expense for uh, the interest of what he was, was going to do. I mean, just to give you a size of the, you know, this is in dry dock here, obviously, and was, was designed for this, this very sharp point to it, uh, cut through the water, and there it is, coming out of when it was launched in 1931. I don't know if that's Hancock or not. I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it is. Prove me long. It's probably not, but <laughs> just see it there. These are some of the interiors of this ship. Pretty nice. <laughs> uh, pretty significant too. Uh, dining room, the rec room. I don't know. Okay. You could go almost 10,000 miles nonstop in this thing with its, uh, what is it, 54,000 gallons of fuel that you could carry. I don't know if he ever did this. If he stood around and said, yeah, it's got twin air injection, full diesel, six cylinder, four cylinder Winston engines, 850 horsepower each, 250 RPMs, 54,000 gallons, 9,500 cruising range, yeah, and a little racing stripe. But wow, 
I mean, they really did uh, what I can't find. I was complaining to someone earlier today. What would you want to know that I can't find? I can't find out what it cost. I, I looked and looked. I just was curious. I just, it would just seem so, that would be just an interesting detail there. But, wow. So this was for serious stuff, though. He was going to go on some expeditions and explorations. And uh, he wanted to go, he spends a lot of time in the Sea of California around Baja. Uh, he will go to the Galapagos Islands a number of times. Uh, in through Panama, the canal, and on to the other side of, of South America on one of his voyages. Uh, they would be dredging in different places. They would be doing core samples. He, would, he needed a whole group of scientists to go with him, and he, he found some uh, in California uh, to make these, uh, to make these uh, trips with him. And they would end up publishing their results, having lectures, there will be news film uh, footage at different times. Um, Mick Mandela brought in a copy of, of this here, if you wanted to take a look at it. This is one of his many, this is from 1933, um, there's a book, and the library has a few copies of this as well, a, a book of really just the history of the Valero III, and it is replete with all kinds of photographs of things that they were dredging up and examining and documenting, and I mean, this was a working uh, scientific uh, vessel that this, uh, this, uh, this man is funding the entire thing and, uh, and going out sometimes for a couple of months at a time uh, during, these, uh, during these years. This is one of their, their dredge boat. They had, I think, three smaller vessels on the, on the Valero. And then you go through the dredging and you the sea bottom and you bring it all up and you examine everything that you find. These are a little hard to see, but some huge, huge specimens of, of sand dog. Uh, do I mean, they look like they're about this big. And I would assume the Sea of, of Cortez or in the Sea of California, but um, um, there's one of those core samples. Drill it into the ocean floor and, uh, and examine it. And all this stuff is just adding into the research. It's kind of like, well, someone else is doing La Brea. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go elsewhere for, for what he was interested in. And, uh, and he brought some people that I have learned enough about to know that these were some significant people in their field uh, that, that he could attract uh, for these, uh, these uh, expeditions. And there, of course, is, is him. The actually is looking at some kind of rope that they have on the deck. Not sure all what they were doing with it. So they would be traveling around on the Galapagos and different islands and and of course, there is the captain with the monkey. Um, someone's holding, it looks like a little, is that a goat? Or something like that. And of course, penguins. It's not smiling. If I was holding a monkey, I couldn't help but <laughs> smile, but I don't know. Or even a penguin. <coughs> yeah. And on the Galapagos, they're moving iguanas, which was one of the things that they did. And uh, moving them to, from one island, uh, capturing some and putting them on an island where there weren't any. And, I, and, uh, and then, of course, you see dumping them out on, uh, on this part of it. Yeah. So these were, these were intensive uh, kinds, of, kinds of things. This got him segued into a, a bizarre case that um, I still don't quite understand. I, you know, there's, there's, as I'll show you, there's, there's some literature, there's some documentaries, there's things uh, about this. There, the Galapagos was, was so barren. There were very few people living there, and by all the accounts in this time period, it was hard living. There was not enough water, there was not very much good soil, there were wild boars that could destroy vegetable gardens if you're trying to do that. There was a German couple <laughs> that was of some significance that moved to one of these outermost islands on the Galapagos in the 1930s 
And they both left a spouse to do this. The whole thing started off strange. They left a spouse, but convinced the two spouses they were leaving to be with each other. It's, it's an, odd, an odd thing. Um, and then they left, and they were, the newspaper accounts kind of followed them a bit as this, uh, this uh, Carl Ritter and this Dora Kerwin as, as a new Adam and Eve uh, out there. And, and then some other people showed up, even more bizarre in a way. And, and if you, bizarre, I mean, if you really learned about those people, they, they had some un, unusual or interesting ideas. And <coughs> Hancock periodically came in contact with them. And so there's this little bit of film, and it's out of, clearly out of a larger film that I want to play. <coughs> This is one of these made, has something that is clearly on the Hancock presentation of things that you find. But uh, anyways, let's just run this here. To the southward, across the equator, to the Galapagos Islands, which are located 600 miles west of Ecuador. We anchor at Black Beach Anchorage, Charles Island, <coughs> also known as Floriana, and are met by Dr. Ritter and Frau Dora Kerwin. It is the third time that Hancock Expeditions have visited the island retreat of this couple, and they are greeting Captain Hancock and Dr. Schmidt, who follows him out of the skiff, as old friends. This couple has forsaken a life of comfort and convenience in Germany to end their days in exile. And just as soon as we have loaded up the donkey, we will begin a trek of 45 minutes from Back Beach Anchorage to Frito, their hermit home. Here, the couple has established a Garden of Eden. Dr. Ritter is Adam, and Dora Kerwin is Eve. Like the original couple, they wear no clothing at all, except when visitors arrive on their island. The milk can will become a watering pot for Dora Kerwin's flower garden. And there are many uses for the utensils and supplies that have been brought from Valero Free. Water is always scarce in the Galapagos, and a shower bath is a luxury. You'll have to pardon our motion picture director, who is bringing up the rear. Accustomed to trekking only along Hollywood Boulevard, he was not accustomed to seven miles of Galapagos lava, and he is fagged, to put it mildly. Fortunately, the home of the Viennese Baroness Wagner Bosque was not far away. Perhaps you remember reading about the so-called queen of the Galapagos Islands. She is not beautiful, but yet attractive enough to have lured two European men to share her exile. The one of them, Philipson, the other Lorenzo, and it is Lorenzo whom you see in this picture. Take a good look at him, for in a moment we will see him in a vastly different role. Let us imagine that a year has elapsed, a year during which time the world has been shocked by news of the disappearance of the Baroness and her companion Philipson. Returning to Marquena Island, northernmost of the Galapagos group in December 1934, Valero III is attracted by a shipwrecked signal of distress and upon investigating, Captain Hancock finds a body which he recognizes as that of Nuberud, a sailor who died clutching a coil of rope. Twenty-five feet away was the desiccated body of Lorenzo, whom we last saw feeding the donkey in the company of the Baroness. These men had died of thirst and not of hunger, for all about was food to be had. What do you think? It's even more confusing now, isn't it? You know? um, so you had this Adam and Eve couple, and, and uh, Carl Ritter was kind of a Nietzsche uh, adherent. He, this life of great sacrifice and denial, and, and uh, I mean, he, he was, sounded like a horrible person to live with. Uh, Dora Kerwin had multiple sclerosis, 
uh, why she decided to go live in the Galapagos Islands in this remote outpost, we don't know. But Hancock, when he showed up, gave them food, gave them s tools, gave them, they needed a lot of things. And he, he just kind of, as I said, comes in and, sh and, and is there. Then this, this other, other individual, th this baroness, or empress as she calls herself with her two lovers, um, she disappears, he's found dead. What has happened to them? This is, of course, uh, Kerwin and, and Ritter. Uh, I mean, life was just miserably challenging and, and hard. It, it got all this interest at the time, but I don't think people really could figure it out so much. There's a book about it, if you want to read, <laughs> about the Galapagos affair and, and the strange things. But what I got out of it was just how difficult this life was that, that you had here. And, and it, wasn't, it wasn't a paradise in, in the slightest remark. And I'm not quite sure, unless you wanted to get away from everything, why you would, why you would choose to, to move there. But what did he say? Although not beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> well, who are you? Jeez. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, you know. And if, and, if, and if you don't want to read, there's a, there's a film about it, the, uh, the Galapagos Affair. The, actually, the library here has it. Satan comes to Eden and uh, with all of these characters. Hancock is not represented here, but he is represented in both the book and the film as you know, the, kind of the benevolent millionaire yachtsman, as they sometimes said. Um, and this odd group of people and, and all of the things that they were, they were kind of kind of doing here uh, at, this, uh, at this time. Very strange uh, uh, thing that, that Hancock got himself uh, into. This wasn't made that many years ago. And so it, it's an interesting film. Has, has any of you seen it? I thought some, oh, oh, Dom, you saw it? Yeah, okay. So, oops. <laughs> that's, that's the wrong island to cast away, sorry. It's not, no, that, was, that was something else. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's pretty good, you know. And you see, in this, this is one of those cases where Hancock leans in the picture because he wants to be in this picture with, uh, with Albert Einstein. I mean, he, he did attract, he did attract some, some uh, significant uh, attention. Just this week, I found then this, I was looking, and, and my initial question that I had, the many I wanted to answer was, well, how many trips did they make? Well, how, you know, just some, some of those basic details that I was uh, hoping to get answers to. And then I came across this, this website. I, w I would love to say I did this since last Tuesday. Um, I don't know yet. I haven't figured who did this. But there's all the, all the trips, 10 trips. And as best as that person can do, you can see there's some holes in, in the data the dates of the trips. Uh, the first one with the Oaxaca in 1927 and leaving in uh, late November, uh, going, getting to the Galapagos. Not quite sure when the trip ended in 1928. And then the different, uh, the different trips all the way through 19, uh, 1941. Uh, pretty good. These are all the various people that went on some or most, or one, of those trips. And so this would be that uh, Granville Plummer Ashcroft went on the last four trips, uh, according to this information. Um, uh, Jack Bumphrey went on the first trip and didn't go on any others. Someone like John Garth went on nine of the 10 trips. You know, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing, and as you see, when you just move over, it tells you what they did where they come from, and, and there's a whole bunch of science in here. Uh, but there's others, you see writers, a guest. Uh, a lot of the associations with Southern California, and when you see the, um, the ones, you see there's some spouses. Uh, when you see the Hancock Foundation, that's not this college, and I'll explain, that's, that's the USC, and um, so they had uh, quite, a, quite a cast of people 
and these expertise, it seemed like only certain voyages did they actually have a ship doctor. Uh, oh, there's uh, Helen, I remember the one that came down in 1939, she went on a, well, she, she went on a couple trips. Um, some of them they're not quite sure, but it, it's a really good record of the Hancock. Thing. I don't know why this person did it, but it's great. Um, very happy, people from around the country. And then this person added uh, links that you can take any of those. Well, he's got about four or five of the trips. And he takes it to the Galapagos. And you can see all the places that, that Hancock went based on, on these charts here. And if you just pick this and you want to go there, and you go here, and you can go into there. And you can find, and then you can find, and you could correlate this with information if you wanted to. And if you drop this person down here, it's like coming in on the moon. One small <laughs> step for man. <laughs> One giant leap for animation. Yeah, it's kind of fun. And like I said, you can, uh, if you want, you can, uh, you can just, so this is, if you're, if you're interested in any of these voyages or what Hancock was doing or any, any you know, as I said, it'll just take you on all kinds of, all kinds of places. Um, and as I said, he's got, it looks like half of them he's got uh, uh, done. Um, one thing I just wanted to point out on the, uh, on the Galapagos, should have done that part first. And of course, there's the, the main islands, and it was, it was out in this area where uh, they were going to be, you know, the, the, the couple and everything, just way out on an outpost of, of this. So, so it's remote enough, and then they're, they're down out there. And so if Hancock wasn't exploring around and doing his dredging and core samples and other stuff, I don't know if he ever would have gone into contact. But then he made a point of looking for them at other, uh, at other occasions. And, and is always kind of seen as this benevolent millionaire who helps these people out. But this is, I thought, just the greatest research. And I haven't even looked at all of what the other things it might, it might tell me. I'm hoping actually to get in contact with whoever put this thing together and see. One of my interests is, why'd you do this? Um, and there's just one photograph, uh, uh, it's Hancock there in the center. But it's a great resource, so if that is something that you were interested at some point, any of you, I mean, you want to know more about this kind of thing, there's, there's a lot of stuff that uh, seems to be coming out. It looked like this might have been created that, uh, that year. Ah, so the Valero is only eight years old and Hancock will give it to USC. He is going to be a, a big benefactor of that university. Uh, he took that vessel and just beque bequeathed it to them. It then, as you see though, they didn't have it too long. When, when the United States got into war, it was attacked uh, by uh, the Japanese on December 7th. One week later, the Valera was purchased by the Maritime Commission and put into military service, in this case, as a weather ship. Um, after the war, Hancock never got it back, and it seems that USC didn't either, and it seemed like it was converted into a yacht. It went through a couple of different owners. The last one that I could find is 1949, under Kuwaiti flag, somebody owned it, and I lost track of what happened to it. I don't know, I mean, it's, it's be pretty old if it exists today, but uh, uh, I, I'm just not sure what happened to, to the Valero III. Um, but he only had those, those short number of years, uh, actually, for all of what he did. But then after the war, he goes with Valero IV. And uh, this wasn't as long, but this was another heavily outfitted scientific um, uh, vessel for more explorations now by this time, how old is Alan Hancock? 
1948. Who can do math? And, and he's still out there on the seas. 73? And, uh, um, or is he 68? No, he's born in 75. I can't do, I can't do complicated addition in two places. 48, 58, 68, 73. There. <laughs> um, <clears throat> But he's, he's still doing this. This vessel is still in service, um, the Valero 4. Uh, it, it, is, it is up in the um, Seattle, Washington area. It's gone through a number of, of hands. Uh, I'm not sure, as you see, it says USC on there. I'm, uh, I'm not completely sure if he gave this to USC or how that, how that connection was made, but they had it for a time and I just looked it up two days ago. You could type in Valero 4, and it'll tell you, I guess, anywhere in the world where it is. And here it is in Doc, <laughs> uh, in, uh, near Seattle, uh, a couple of days ago. And not looking quite as good as it did <coughs> in 48, but uh, you know, it's, it's got some age on it. Uh, but still used in, um, in some research capacity. And again, this is part of that long-term legacy of of what people uh, like Hancock were, uh, were creating. So uh, that's the end of his Valeros, if you thought there was a five or a six, or it's just, there's just the four, uh, but that seems to be uh, good enough for a person of, of his age. I'm gonna talk more about this on, on his, because it, it overlaps with Los Angeles and Santa Maria, but he was an accomplished musician his mother had a great interest in, in music and, and encouraged or pushed him. He's considered a prodigy on the cello. Uh, she would, when she attained wealth, buy him basically the Stradivarius of cellos. Uh, and he had a couple of them. And he played extensively for years. And in those presentations they did, I just love this kind of combination. Come and see us play music, uh, watch some motion pictures that we've made, like that maybe. Um, uh, we'll tell you about our maritime explorations, uh, scientific, thrilling, educational. That's a maker space if I ever heard, you know, <laughs> mix those things in there. And he looked for scientists, if he could, that had musical talent because he wanted to play while they were on those voyages. And, and he apparently found some people. Now this is this is an ensemble that he's going to form in, in Santa Maria. Uh, again, he throws himself into these things. Uh, he, uh, he's going to be with the Los Angeles Sympathy, Sympathy Symphony, <laughs> and he's going to form his own ensemble and give hundreds of performances up and down the coast of California for years. He's going to do more, and I'm going to just talk about more of that on the... Uh, on the third, uh, the, the third look at, uh, at him. In Southern California, he conceptualizes that he wanted to house all of this stuff that they're collecting, all this information. He is also buying information. He's going to uh, uh, scientific libraries and collecting things. So kind of what Henry Huntington does with his art and book collection turns it into a house museum and the, and the Huntington Library as it is today. Hancock doesn't have that, <clears throat> so he decides that on the USC campus he will build this building. And why would they let him do it? Because he paid for it. Um, it was about $400,000 in 1941. Um, they name it the Allen Hancock uh, Foundation uh, you know, uh, for him. And you see on the one end of the building, you've got all these animals, that are kind of reminiscent of La Brea tar pits. Um, and in it then, he wants a lot of things uh, collected. As, as I mentioned last time, they saved some of the interiors of the, of the Villa Madonna when they tore it down. And that's where they're at inside this building, uh, along with shelves and shelves, I assume, of all kinds of <laughs> of scientific uh, information. So that, this is the plaque that's now in front of the building. Over the years, he is going to donate a total of about $7 million to USC. Um, a lot of it to their music programs. 
He took particular interest in students sometimes. He, he attended lots of college performances, and if there were certain students that he liked, he apparently anonymously had money given to them in the forms of scholarships. He gave money to programs. At one time, there's going to be a, a concert hall named after him. It has since been changed. It's now named after the Randy Newman's family, if you know Randy Newman, uh, the musician. Um, but the, here this uh, plaque is talking, this is that put on after his, uh, his death about his long contributions to, uh, to USC. Now he never attended USC, he didn't go to college, uh, wasn't any, any connection like, uh, like that. Um, but he did, uh, he was an ardent supporter. This is just a little bit of some of the major subjects that are in there. I don't see you writing anything, but that's fine. Um, <laughs> That's an example of just one section, and this is, as you see, part of from his book purchasing. Just in the natural history section, there's about 78,000 books that go back basically to the <coughs> Renaissance <laughs> up into the mid-1940s. Uh, uh, um, and so it's, a, it's an enormous collection. I, I don't know how significant it is in the world of science today. I'm just, that's something I'd, I'd ask. Susie and I are having this issue. Every time we call this building, they never call back. So we're not quite sure what it's going to take. <laughs> um, but <clears throat> well, what they, this is all from their website, like the, this thing. And this gets into much, much smaller detail uh, as well as, as to what he had. So he gives them the Valero III. He builds them a building. He gives them those things. And they made him a trustee in 1939, and he would be a trustee until 1954, when it ends badly. <laughs> he gave them a section of, he had a real estate investment near the uh, farmer's market, if you know that area, in, near La Brea, tar pits, and he gave them land, and part of that farmer's market, which has the original adobe, which goes back to the beginning of that rancho, he gave it to USC, to fund the operation of the foundation. And they sold it. <laughs> they sold the land. And he cut them off. <laughs> and I got this from his, his great granddaughter. And she said, why you would do that? You know, why they're, they're thinking, but, but he resigned as trustee. Later they made him trustee for life, which was just kind of an honor. But, uh, but he, it, didn't, it didn't end really all that well. Uh, but they had a, a long association uh, with, the, uh, with the two of them. Later in his life, because of the La Brea situation and all of the contributions, and of course the, the, uh, the, the foundation, and by this time in his life, this college and all of the land, the history on the land here with the flight school and all the other things that he has done. Uh, they're making these, uh, as you see, this bust and um, all for him. And of course, there's, a, there's one of those uh, out in front of the, uh, the library. And there's, this is the one down at La Brea. And uh, there's him, as you see, posing with it. They have refurbished that bust. As you see, they've changed it. In the 1970s, they, this was the original one. And his great granddaughter said she was scheduled to go to a rededication of it, but had a car accident the day before and wasn't able to go. So some guy just showed up, I don't know, <laughs> drifter um, down there. Now, a man with all of that in Los Angeles, with that history, with all those decades there, um, not surprisingly, you know, he's a member of a number of associations. He was a member of the California Club, which by their own, this was founded in the 1880s, 1888. By their, their own saying is, this is where the people who own Los Angeles go. And it's almost their own like, eh. Um, but this is the exclusive private members only club. And Alan Hancock is a member uh, in, his, in his time there. Because of his musical uh, associations and interests, he's a member of this gamut club, which promoted music and gave performances, encouraged musicianship, uh, was you know, a significant music organization uh, that he's a, uh, he's a member of. 
He's a member of the Los Angeles Athletic Club, and that's a more modern version, but you see of the dining room of that. I mean, these are the Tony things that you'd find uh, here. And he was, not surprisingly, a member of the Los Angeles Yacht Club. <laughs> you'd, think he, you'd think he would be as well. So why is a guy who has this association, has this foundation building, has his land, has his legacy, has all this connection with, with Southern California, has all these things here, why does he move here? <laughs> why does he come here to a town of about 7,000 people? Um, uh, you know, it's okay, it's not, you know, 1929, he's, he's, he's started to make associations a little earlier than that. He hasn't exactly moved here, but soon, soon he will. Why does he do that, and what does he want to accomplish here? In a way, it seems you could say he's retiring, but when you look at them, what he does in the next 30 years, he doesn't seem to have retired at all. And he's going to have that effect on Santa Maria, as I said, in a way that he has in Los Angeles. Um, and, and again, his, his wealth is going to allow him to do things what other people couldn't do. Um, but I think it's a, it's a story, uh, he doesn't entirely leave Los Angeles, he always keeps a place to stay, but he does gravitate and end up living here. And on the, um, from the Galapagos. <laughs> <laughs> on the, um, came from the book or something. On the, on the last lecture, I'm going to show you his house, the interiors of his house, his, his uh, multiple interests that he had in, in Santa Maria uh, with the railroad and the flight school, and, and not just the flight school, but his funding of these extraordinary uh, uh, achievements in, in flight, and then his association with the school and, and World War II, and all of these things, he's, he's just as busy, it seems, in the last third of his life as he is in the first third, two thirds of his, uh, of his life. So, so that's as far as I'm going tonight. And I do hope, though, it's in two weeks. Next week, uh, I don't know what you're going to do on Friday. You're going to have to figure that out. <laughs> but in two weeks, there is going to be a reception. And where's the reception at? Right out the courtyard. Uh, and there's going to be food and wine. wine. And see how much better the talk will be. After you? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and then the and then the last lecture starting at about about six o'clock. So, so I thank you again for coming.